I just took a picture of you somehow. Nice. <laughs> It'll be worth something one day. <laughs> All right, this last section is on conservation biology and uh, how to conserve um, the species we have on the planet, which we know are rapidly disappearing. We are in the middle of a major extinction, as big as the ones that killed off the dinosaurs. Um, maybe even bigger. Creatures are going extinct at a very fast rate. And this is kind of a, uh, a graph showing the numbers of different species out there that we have studied. But certainly it's not exhaustive. There are a whole lot of other species out there that we've yet to study. Scientists estimate maybe there's 30 million species on the planet. And uh, we've so far studied a couple million. Most of the species that we've yet to discover are microscopic. And uh, they know every time they delve in and start looking at microscopic organisms, there's a lot of them out there that nobody know, really knows about. So that's good that we call this the biodiversity of the planet. Biodiversity means the diversity of life. And what we do know, though, is that a lot of these species are going extinct. And they're doing it at a rate that's about 30 times the background rate of extinction. The background rate is the normal rate of extinction. Normally, organisms go extinct sometimes. And uh, so there's, a, there's a, a few organisms that every year will go extinct because um, you know, conditions change, and uh, they had a design that might have used to work in an old condition, but in the new conditions, it doesn't work, and then they go extinct. Um, but we find that because of the proliferation of humans on the planet, a lot of these creatures are going extinct. And it's for a lot of reasons. There's, uh, there's human hunting, and, and pollution, and, and especially habitat destruction. We're cutting down a lot of forests and things to build all these roads and places to live and farms and all sorts of things. So uh, we're going to talk about the reasons that we're losing this biodiversity tomorrow. Um, and we might get into it a little bit today, too. It's We've learned lessons about messing with nature. And this talks about this graph here talks about one of the attempts that scientists made to um, uh, save some organisms. Um, they noticed that in this area, which is in um, Flathead Lake in Montana, in the 1960s and 70s, they noticed the amount of salmon in the lake were going way down. And um, they were troubled by that. So what they decided to do is they watched the salmon, and the salmon eat, they know that salmon eat shrimp, is one of the things that they eat. So they introduced a type of shrimp called the possum shrimp, and thought that the salmon would eat the possum shrimp, and the salmon numbers would go up. And they show right here a little graph in 1981 where they introduced the possum shrimp. And it shows the levels of the possum shrimp. And you can see the possum shrimp went up in a classic uh, J-shaped pattern. But what scientists didn't understand was this possum shrimp eats zooplankton. <coughs> and, the, and so do the salmon. The salmon also eats zooplankton. And this possum shrimp ate up all the zooplankton, and it actually caused the salmon numbers to go down. And, and the salmon numbers are, in, are the gold bars there, and you see them going way down. And then, of course, after the salmon dropped, the number of bald eagles in the area dropped, and also the number of bears in the area dropped, because bears eat salmon too. So the whole food chain was affected, and everything kind of crashed down here. And it was kind of a dead lake after they did that. And the, the 
lesson here is that everything is interconnected. And it's not always easy to predict the outcome of experiments that you try to pull off in nature. And so you need to beware of trying to do things like that. Um, and this is, you know, a simple food chain here. Um, and what they did when they added the, the shrimp, they added a, a notch, an extra chain in the food chain. So when the shrimp ate the zooplankton, the shrimp used up a lot of that energy in the shrimp's everyday life and uh, wasted a lot of the energy of the, of the entire ecosystem there. Um, so the more diversity we can get in our ecosystem, the better. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And they kind of list them in the book and they talk about each of them in a paragraph. Um, organisms all have a medicinal value. <clears throat> Most of our medication comes from plants. Did you know that? And uh, plants in the rainforest. Who has the movie uh, Medicine Man right now? Right. Is it one of y'all? No, I just me. Okay. Stephanie has it? Stephanie, can you bring that back? Yes. That talks about how uh, they find this cure for cancer in the rainforest. And uh, because of the cutting of the rainforest, it, it's, uh, it's, I'm not going to ruin it for you, but in danger of being lost. It's a good movie. Um, the medicinal value of, uh, say, antibiotics, all of those are produced by plants or fungi, uh, organisms that you find in nature. Um, and we have to keep coming up with new antibiotics because the disease organisms evolve to resist the ones that we're using. Penicillin kills only about half the organisms uh, that it used to kill. All of the other organisms are now resistant to it. So uh, there's a high medicinal value you want to keep the biodiversity. You want to save these rainforests because they might, there's surely medications there that we could use. <coughs> Excuse me. Agricultural value. Um, all the different, the biodiversity out there provides crops for us, provides food. Uh, you want to maintain that. Um, you never know. If you lose a species, it might have some agricultural value that you don't know of in the future that you can grow. Consumptive use value talks about, oh, fishing and hunting, things like that. We use, you know, if you buy, if you go buy a fish sandwich somewhere, you know somebody caught that fish and, and cut it up, and, that, and that's why you're eating a fish sandwich. Um, and there's, you know, all sorts of organisms out there that we use. So that's what they're talking about, consumptive use value, using organisms uh, you know, for food, for clothing, for all kinds of things. Biogeochemical cycling talks about those, remember the water cycle and the carbon cycle? Uh, living things cycle this stuff through the atmosphere and through the, through the water. And um, the only way to get carbon out of the air and put it into food that you eat is through the carbon cycle, which is all done by plants and algae. If you lose these organisms, you're going to lose the ability to make food and uh, to do other stuff, to cycle nitrogen through, to cycle water through and clean the water up. Um, Biogeochemical -geo cycling is a very important thing that living things do. Waste recycling, the decomposers that are around the earth. If you have a dead tree fall, the tree doesn't just sit there. All of its dead body is consumed by decomposers and its body is returned to the ground for use by other plants. And uh, this waste recycling is an important thing done by nature. You want to maintain biodiversity so you have organisms that can do that. 
fresh water. The, as the water percolates through the ground, there are plants and soil bacteria that take things, impurities and such, remove them from the water and clean the water for us. You don't get fresh water without having all these organisms to clean the water for you. There are sewage treatment plants that can do some of this, can clean the water, but they're expensive. Nature does it for free. Prevention of erosion, like that paragraph you just said, you just read, if the, uh, if the trees are all cut down, you get major erosion occurring. Regulation of climate is important. You have a uh, living thing kind of balance out the environment. It doesn't get too hot uh, or too cold in an area of the forest where there's a lot of organisms that are holding water in their bodies that can balance the climate out. And finally, ecotourism. Sometimes it's just nice to go out. Does anyone like hiking or camping or, you know, go to the net, a natural nature preserve or national park. So there we go. There's a rosy periwinkle. Um, what is the medicine that that does? Does it say? This is on 910. Provide some kind of medication. I don't know what that is. This is a um, armadillo. You know what the armadillo does? It's a, a medical research organism. The armadillo can carry a certain disease that no other animal except humans carries. You know what it is? Polyarthritis? Leprosy. And so if, if they want to experiment on the leprosy bug, they, they grow it in armadillos unless you're going to infect people with it in your lab, which is probably not a good idea. So you can get like, touch them? Um, I don't know how you get it from them. I think you can, but I'm not sure how. Maybe eating one that's not cooked is probably more of a way of getting it. You're probably not eating armadillos, but I'm sure there are people somewhere eating armadillos. I think most people are immune to leprosy, though, like naturally. Oh, really? Yeah, I've that somewhere. Really? I don't know. Um, oh, here's shrimp boat. I think I told y'all before, there used to be something like 1,500 shrimp boats on the coast of Georgia. Not too long ago, 40, 50 years ago. Now there's 300. Just not as much food out there. Pollination is important. Um, one of the problems in the United States right now, in North America right now, are a, a lack of pollinators. For some reason, the amount of bees are decreasing. Scientists Ooh. don't really know why. They think it might be a fungus or something like that. Some sort of parasite that's killing them. Hate bees. Killer bees. Probably my least favorite. Um, I think the number of killer bees are being are reduced also. I don't know. I thought they were still spreading. They're coming up from Mexico. Yeah. I knew that. It's getting warmer and warmer, so. Yeah. They might, they might go north. But I think the, the lack of the bees has something to do with the... Uh, with the, with some sort of parasite. There's a name for it, like like hive death or yeah, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Now, if we don't have enough bees to pollinate our flowers, you know, all the fruits that you buy at the grocery store, they, those all came from flowers that had to be pollinated. And so, you, if you're a farmer, you can't grow fruit without the pollinator. Um, control of agricultural pests. Here is a ladybug, and see, ladybugs eat the little tiny uh, insects that the aphids that eat the plants. And so the ladybug is helping the farmer out by doing that. Of course, if you lose some of these species, you know, if, if we lost the ladybug, the aphids would increase, and then they'd eat up all the plants, and then you wouldn't have enough plants. How does rubber come from a tree? Um, yeah, this is rubber. It's, it's part of the sap of a tree. 
Um, it's made from the sap of a tree, and I'm not exactly sure how they make it. But you want to get yeah, this natural rubber. Uh, they have synthetic rubber, I think, is made by some kind of chemical process. But uh, you know, this guy's uh, working the tree here. Um, if you don't cut down the tree, you'll have a source of rubber that can be used over and over because the tree will keep making it. And so uh, if, if we can figure out a way to work with um, nature so that we're not using it all up at once. Here's an example. Yep. Okay, you gotta roll that on the floor. Six, huh? There you go. Don't worry about these guys. They're just AP bio kids. Okay. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, go ahead and laugh. Let me give you an example of how a successful tree farmer works. Let's say you have a huge swath of land and you grow pine trees on it. What you do is you can divide the land up into sections. It takes about 30 years to grow a, a nice sized pine tree to cut. We need wood, right? So instead of just cutting the whole thing at once, taking your wood, and then you're stuck. For 30 years, you don't have a source of wood. What you do is you, you plant here. Um, let's say we planted in 2010. And here you plant in 2015. And here you plant in 2020. 2025, 20, 2030, 20, and 2035. What year are you going to cut these? 2040. 2040, you cut these and replant. 2045, you cut these and replant. Do you see how you can just rotate here? And every five years, you'll have a swath to cut. And if you have enough land, you can do that. And so there's constantly, uh, you're constantly growing, there are trees growing somewhere where you can cut. And you could imagine you could divide this in 30 pieces if you had enough land and have one a year, one plot a year that you're cutting. So big, if you have enough land, you can do that. The problem is people get, get you know, greedy. There's money out there to be had. And you, you sell some of this land, then all of a sudden there's not enough. You sell a land and build houses or something on it, and now you don't have enough to keep rotating it like this. And, uh, and that, that's one of the problems with the growing population. We're growing so fast that our land cannot support our needs, and that can be a problem. And uh, you have to be careful and manage your property correctly. Hey, that lady, she just likes nature. That's what that's saying. <coughs> I like her belt. <laughs> this is a graph showing biodiversity, how uh, biodiversity and photosynthesis are related. If you have a small number of species somewhere, here we have one plant species in our area. This is how much photosynthesis uh, on average is occurring, the rate of photosynthesis. You can see if we add, if we have 16 plant species, the rate goes up. Now it levels off, but it still goes up. The more plant species you have in an area, the greater amount of production, the greater production, the greater amount of photosynthesis that area can achieve. So a single, you don't want to have just a single plant species in your forest. If you, could, if you want it to be the most productive, you have a bunch of different species. Unfortunately, timber forests like this, they try to keep it all just one species. They actually spray out and kill or set fires and destroy some of the other species they grow, so it's one individual species. That can be dangerous because if something comes along, like a beetle or something that infects your trees, you, it's going to kill them all. 
because they're all the same species. And so uh, some of the techniques nowadays use various species to save their, save their farms from problems like that. Now, this next section goes into the causes of extinction. And you don't really have to read 47.3 tomorrow, but I want to start it because there's uh, stuff I want to show you all tomorrow. But uh, here is the major reasons for losing organisms. Habitat loss, that's cutting down uh, forests and building roads and such. That's, look how much that affects. This is percent of species affected by threat. <coughs> And these are the different threats. So most species out there are affected by habitat loss. There are very few species that do better when humans move into the area and start cutting things down. I mean, there are some. Dogs do better. Cats do better because they live with humans. Rats probably do pretty well. Roaches. <coughs> but most are threatened and killed uh, by habitat loss. Exotic species is introducing a, a, an organism to an area where it didn't live before. Have you all ever heard of kudzu? Mm -hmm. That was from Japan, right? Yeah, kudzu came from Japan. They said, this stuff grows really fast. This will be great. We'll put it on our roadsides for when we build a new road, and it'll quickly grow around and dig its roots in and keep the, keep the dirt that we put there in the right place. And unfortunately, there's no natural predator. There's, no, there's nothing around here that no insects or anything that eat that kudzu, like there are in Japan. And so now the kudzu is growing out of control. If you go to up around Atlanta, you see it growing everywhere. You get the Japanese field. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. And again, that's kind of dangerous. You bring that over yeah. here, and now you got something else over here that's not. It's like the old lady who swallowed a fly. You know, one time I don't know that. Remember that? Yeah. Swallowed a fly, they swallowed a spider. The dog and oh, because the spider was going after the fly. Um, pollution. We will talk about. Uh, there's How lots of forms of pollution out there. Where does that even come from? Things like global warming. That's carbon dioxide pollution. There's um, there's uh, nitrogen pollutants. Um, all sorts of things that we pump into the atmosphere and and dump into our oceans. And that's a problem. Overexploitation is like overfishing and overhunting, catching too many things. Um, disease is it's a small bit of uh, problem there, but it is still something that can uh, threaten a species. So what, what they've done is they've made a list of all the species that are soon to be extinct. Those are the endangered species list. And there's another group that's uh, not soon to be extinct, but looks like it's on its way there. It's called the threatened species list. And we've tried to make laws to protect these species. And you can protect them pretty well from over-exploitation, from over-hunting. In some cases, you can. You know, you can put it a preserve, you know? Um, and so that's what we try to do to protect some of these species. It's sometimes difficult, and it's sometimes impossible. If the number of organisms gets so low that there's hardly any genetic diversity left, um, you may not be able to save a species. If there's only 10 manatees left in the world, I know there's a lot more than that now, but you can imagine a species that keeps getting closer to extinction. At some point, they're all related to one another. And if they have kids, how are their kids going to have kids? They'd be having children with their own relations, and there may not be enough genetic diversity to have viable offspring to continue the, the species. And so at some point, the amount of organisms gets too low to save them. Yeah. Do scientists mm -hmm. ever, like, determine species extinct and then later, like, find more? Yeah, actually, that's happened a few times. Have you ever heard of the coelacanth? It's a little fish with those lobe fins. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. They said that was most extinct. They had only found it in fossils. And then on a trip to South Africa, scientists was walking by, and a guy was pushing a cart, and there was a coelacanth on top of the cart. And he was like, yeah, 
We thought it was extinct and we found it. What's up? The seal camp? Yeah. Yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. What's going on? Scratching your deal. That's fine. Totally breaking up here. Thank you. I don't think I can go look at it. You're on video now. I videoed you. Is that extinct? It is extinct. <laughs> they, they're still looking they, for they, it now. There might still be some. Yeah. yeah. There, there's evidence that they they right. heard it, but it's it's still alive. Yeah, and there's a there's an animal. There was a movie about a some type of animal, some type of. Uh, Can we watch fresh cut it? Tasmanian, a Tasmanian. Tasmanian wolf. Yeah, no, the Tasmanian tiger. Tasmanian tiger. Yeah. Did y'all see that movie? No, I just I, I remember. Yeah, there was a movie about about that. They think it's extinct, but there might still be some. Yeah, Can you watch it? Um, if you had like two different groups of, this is probably stupid, but it doesn't make sense in my head right now. If there's like two different families of uh -huh. animals, and they have kids, and their kids have kids, and then their kids have kids, then there's always going to be someone. So as long as there's like, two families, just like it would be okay, right? Well, if you have two different families, then you have more genetic diversity. Now, if one from this family and one from this family mate, and they have kids, now their kids are related, and if the kids mate with one another, that might if the kids that might present with, difficulties. If the kids mate with like their cousins, like their first cousins. I mean, the further away from you you mate, the less chance there is of genetic problems. <coughs> but. I mean, there are several families of um, lemurs, for instance, in Madagascar, but there's not very many, and they're starting to have problems. Most lemurs that you find in Madagascar are screwed up, they're genetically blind or born blind or stuff like that, and they're just there. And the reason why is because the genetic diversity is so low. So it depends on the species. It depends on how fast they reproduce, and uh, sometimes a species can come back from just a small number, and sometimes they need, they might need two families, they might need five families, you know, it might, it might need a hundred, and just, it, it's, it's not set in stone how that divvying up of the genetics works, and a lot of it has to do with luck. You know, you, you can have babies with your brother and sister and have normal babies, but sometimes you get unlucky and they don't turn out. So luck has some more chance of them turning out and not normal, basically. I don't know. I don't know if there's more, or, but you know, if you're mating close to your close to your family, mm -hmm. no, some so animals much. don't have any choice. You know, they have to mate with their own families because that's the only ones that are around. So it's a difficult problem. Look at this. This is a this is a rainforest from a satellite photo, and they're building roads into the rainforest to cut the trees. Good source of wood. There's another rainforest. There it is. And look, it's been cut up. Just a few patches left. 